Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel here with the 3 o'clock rock on a Wednesday. Um, I am the host of Energy in America, which plays bi-weekly on at Wednesday on 3, 3 p.m. Our guest and co-contributor on the show is Lucien Pugliaresi. He's the CEO of EPRIG, an energy policy think tank in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the show yet again, Lou. Welcome. Happy to be here. You know, uh, this has been an active week in terms of uh, Mr. Trump's uh, uh, appointments and suggestions of appointment later. And um, we're surrounded with uh, news about uh, his uh, most recent ones. He has announced that he'll be appointing Rick Perry, uh, who was governor of Texas for 14 years, as secretary of energy, which is a critically important post for you and me and everyone. And he's also announced that he is appointing uh, Rex, Rex, Willison, uh, Rex Tillerson, sorry, uh, the CEO of uh, ExxonMobil as a Secretary of State. Uh, also, Ryan Zinke for Interior and Scott Pruitt for EPA. Yeah. All of these things play on energy. So at this point, we'd like to know from you uh, how, these, how these things will play on energy and what, if anything, we should be thinking and doing and how the community should react. So, so let's, let's start with uh, Governor Perry. Okay infamously in 2011 couldn't remember the name of one agency he wanted to eliminate which was uh, the Department of Energy yeah but uh, you know the Department of Energy people may not know this has about a 32 billion dollar budget but uh, 12 billion dollars of that goes to the uh, uh, essentially the bomb program and the building of uh, naval nuclear reactors so about 7 billion goes to clean energy and you know there's a lot of uh, a lot of discussion about Perry as a climate denier. He's probably not a big fan of climate control policies and things like that. But what's interesting is Texas probably has the most successful, successful wind and solar program in the USA. They spent well over a billion dollars building out their grid. Uh, they have the highest level of wind and solar generation in the U.S. He was very supportive of... Uh, renewables. Huh. And he was there at the time all this was happening, too. Yeah, he, he supported that. He supported it. So he, he supported renewables really as a diversification strategy, as a way more of a criteria pollutant concern than a climate concern, right? A lot of people don't like coal because of SO2 or particulates, things like that. They may, they may view the climate stuff as sort of unimportant, but they may still can support the, you know, uh, renewables. Well, assuming it was left up to Rick Perry, uh, given his um, experience in Texas and the views he has expressed about energy, what, what's his profile look like? What would he do in office? So, you know, DOE really doesn't have direct control over oil and gas development. Much of it. It's really, um, oil and gas development is really managed by two groups. First, access to public lands by the interior department, and then the regulation of national regulations uh, by EPA. But much, much of the regulation, particularly hydraulic fracturing, is done by the states. Mm -hmm. But I do think that we would, I would expect from Governor Perry to restore the role as, EP, as DOE as the counterweight to EPA. And whether he'll need to do that in the Trump administration, we can talk about in a minute. <laughs> but uh, historically, DOE played a big, you know, EPA had an, often a very aggressive program to do X or Y, and the DOE folks would weigh in and say, well, you know, that's not really a good, a good thing for national economic growth or for energy security. We think you should, we should have an interagency meeting and talk about it. So. Well, what, how, what has uh, Donald Trump said about energy? I mean, he's obviously not as much into renewables as Obama has been. Um, yeah. But what has he said he's going to do about it? I mean, we know he, he's made statements in favor of coal and, you know, some of the fossil fuels. Um, but what, what do you think is in his plan? What has he said is in his plan for renewables? So, you know, a president like Trump speaks in very broad strokes, we might say. And he... Uh, doesn't he doesn't really have a specific plan. I think his basic, and you can look by the people he's meeting with, his basic approach is, well, oil and gas 
is a huge engine of economic growth. He's really worried about this low rate of growth. We have low rate, we have what many people might call a job filled non recovery. <laughs> Unemployment is down, but you know, wage rates are stagnant, participation rate is still low. We're not, we're not seeing, one of the reasons he became president, I believe, is we're not seeing the growth in wages and opportunities and the Rust Belt and other parts of the country. So I think part of his theme is to turn loose this huge engine of, of oil and gas development. And in that case, I think you will see things like the Keystone Pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline, perhaps even more uh, permitting, permitting breakthroughs in natural gas pipelines. This sort of thing, I think, is going to be much more aggressive in trying to approach it like a businessman. Mm -hmm. And he, he keeps saying, I'm not sure he really understands how all this stuff works together yet, but he does have a sense from talking to people that, well, you know, there's a, too much uncertainty in the permit, too much uncertainty in business development. And this ties all back to his strategy for a lower corporate tax rate to bring back the funds from abroad. And today he met with all the high-tech companies, I think Bill Gates and uh, I think uh, Bezos, uh, Amazon, uh, and uh, basically said, look, uh, I, I want to grow the economy. I want to grow much faster. I know you guys didn't vote for me, but let's talk about what we need to do. Mm -hmm. so he's a very transactional guy. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing that uh, came out today was that uh, was Janet Yellen said that uh, the Fed would raise uh, interest w one quarter point. Uh, does this have any effect on the, I mean, and, and the commentators uh, are saying, well, it's not going to have much of an effect on the economy, but does it have an effect on energy, do you think? No, I don't think, of I think energy is almost, I mean, of course, you have to raise capital to make investments. But that is more determined by the price of oil and the mm -hmm. price of natural mm -hmm. gas. I mean, you can pass the hat at the River Oaks Club in Houston and get capital almost any day of the week to drill a hole. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Now, that's not exactly what's happened. Yeah. But a lot of folks did it that way. Uh, so I don't think so far we're not seeing a shortage of capital. What we're seeing is a, you know, a shortage of profitable prospects. But with the recent OPEC deal, the fact that oil prices appear to be settling around 55 to 60. Uh, EIA, in fact, announced this morning that this was the first month since the downturn that U.S. oil production had actually increased. Mm -hmm. Well, OPEC, uh, so OPEC finally, uh, I mean, they were trying to get themselves to all agree and to limit production. Now they finally did agree. Eh? How, how is that going to affect, um, you know, the price of oil at the pump here in the U.S.? So I, I think there may be somewhere between 10 and 15 cents there, but it really depends on how well this thing sticks. I remain suspicious that they can get a lot of yield out of this. Mm -hmm. The natural, you know, the long-run equilibrium price of oil is probably somewhere between 60, 55 and 65, probably $60, and sometimes it will go over and sometimes it'll go below, and sometimes OPEC will be able to get it there a little faster, but that's where we're headed. But you know, it, it raises, uh, you know, something that I think a lot of people forgot about, and namely that, yes, oil can go up. And, you know, some people have predicted, a lot of people have predicted that it will go up. And now here's some proof that it is going up. <laughs> and, and maybe this will make people more aware of the need to get into renewables to hedge against an ongoing increase in oil. So the U.S. now produces uh, about 10% of its energy from renewables, right? But 78% of that 10% is from other sources than wind and solar. Mm -hmm. That means hydro, hydro and maybe a little geothermal and cats and dogs, wood pellets, who knows, stuff like that. But, so... Wind and solar, yeah, people talk a lot about it. Its rate of growth has been fantastic. It is still an extremely small player in the U.S. And, in fact, in some communication I did have with Governor Perry, I felt that, it was, as a follow-up for our discussion we had last week, which is, 
if he's really looking for a mission on the research side for DOE, we need to address the intermittency. You know, they're probably going to get that budget cut, but if you really want the wind and solar to come in, it appears to be performing above what we expected. But it still doesn't, we still haven't solved the intermittency problem. And the way, the only way we're going to solve the intermittency problem is to get the storage issue fixed. Yep. And the only way, that's probably, if it were me, I'd put more money into storage than carbon capture, than all this exotic right. uh, enzymes and biofuels. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, I agree with And And the interesting yeah. point is that uh, maybe it's a time to invest in storage. <laughs> or, yeah. or invest in companies that are investing in storage. The, the other part of storage, of course, is all the software and the black boxes that connect the storage to the renewables and ultimately the grid. And, um, you know, we have in Hawaii a number of them that are trying to do that, and it's a software play. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking that if I was uh, going to, if I was going to commit, say, as part of my New Year's resolution in 2017, to invest in energy, that's what I would put my money. I'd put my money in storage wherever in the world it was being developed, and I would put it in the, the black boxes and the software that will deliver, you know, the energy to and from the storage devices. Right. I, I, st I still think that you know, we, you know, we still have a lot of advantages with the dispatchable power. And only if you can get the storage down to be efficient, cheap, ease of use, and address also the capital cost of the grid. Only then will it comp compete on a pure economic realm with dispatchable power. Now that's going to be the interesting thing about the Trump administration. Most of the renewable programs in the utility sector are renewable portfolio standards, subsidies driven by the state, by the states. Mm -hmm. I'm almost positive that you're going to see some retrenchment of the U.S. Uh, federal programs in those areas. How do you mean Not retrenchment? I mean, uh, we're talking about going I mean, backwards? Extended their, extended their mandates or other kinds of directives from the federal government. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure to pull back on those. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, have, our own, let's have our own retrenchment here for a minute, Lou. We're going to take a short break. We're going to retrench. Yeah. And I'm going to come back and talk to you about some of the other appointments that have come up in, in the last week or so. Sure. That's uh, Lou Pugliarisi of ePrink. We'll be right back on Energy in America. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Aloha, my name is Richard Emery, host of Condo Insider. More than a third of Hawaii's population live in some form of association. And our show is all about educating board members and owners about their responsibilities and obligations and providing solutions for a great association. You can watch me live on Thursdays, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. each week. Aloha. Okay, we're back, retrenched. Uh, energy in America with Lucien Pudirisi of EPRING, an energy think tank in Washington, D.C. So, Lou, uh, you know, the, there, was, uh, there were other appointments mentioned, um, not only um, Rick Perry, um, but also uh, the Secretary of State. And you mentioned that when we spoke, and I'm wondering what is the connection, at least for energy policy, uh, between the appointment of this guy, who is the CEO of uh, ExxonMobil, um, uh, and the Secretary of State. How does the Secretary of State, how could he, would he, might he, affect energy policy? So historically there's been, at least in the recent history, there's been two or three ways the Secretary of State uh, plays in this particular sandbox. First, we are, the, the State Department is responsible for negotiating international agreements, for example, uh, coordinated drawdown of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in the crisis through the International Energy Agency. 
Uh, under the uh, Obama administration, Secretary Kerry had a special envoy for climate. It will be interesting to see whether that special envoy for climate will continue in the next administration, which is, which is curious about this because Trump himself said climate was a hoax. But Rex Tillerson's company, and Rex Tillerson, supports three things. He supports a carbon tax. That's he supports good. the Paris Accord. And I think he supports uh, doing some carbon capture and storage for natural gas production, natural gas combustion. So how it's going to be quite interesting to see what happens when he goes up for Senate confirmation. But the biggest problem he has, it seems to me right now, is that um, he is viewed as having a close relationship with Vladimir Putin. And uh, this, you know, the House Foreign Affairs Committee has started to raise a lot of concerns about this. So you'll want to watch the hearings for great fun. Well, I mean, you know, there was an article in the Times, um, a very, you know, a very well-researched article about what happened uh, with Putin and manipulating the election electronically. And it's pretty scary. I mean, where before it might have been just a suggestion, now there seems to be really legs under, under that argument. And yeah, I, I, I think it has a way to go before it, you know, we find out what happened. No, I, I'm sure it seems, it clearly has, uh, you know, agitated Senator McCain, Lindsey Graham, and some others on the committee. So I think they will be, you know, that's a sort of separate drill. It's really not a Tillerson problem. I do think, though, it's going to be very interesting to see what Tillerson says about both energy policy and about Russia. I think this question that he's a good buddy with Putin is way overdone. I mean, they hand out those awards to anybody who mm -hmm. helps out in Russia or is part of a deal. It's not that big a deal. And Rex Tillerson's a very smart guy. I suspect his testimony will go quite well. So. And he's supported by, by Majority Leader McConnell. So what, what effect, I mean, I, you know, it's really an interesting question to raise uh, that somehow, in some way, the Secretary of State would have an effect on hmm, global energy, energy policy, you know, the allocation of resources, the price of resources. Does the Secretary of State have a real hand in that? Because if so, we should be, you know, looking at him from that point of view and I cautious about that. His levers are really in international cooperation, contingencies. Actually, the State Department did uh, try to encourage some tech, tra uh, tech transfer for hydraulic fracturing. They encouraged the poles. They created uh, various seminars and workshops so they could have access to the understanding of the technology. And in a general sense, the motivation behind that was to expand the world production of natural gas as opposed to coal. Yeah. Well, let's uh, move on to a couple of the others now. Uh, I, 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 I'd like to talk about Scott Pruitt. Um, is he the one who was appointed to the uh, EPA, I'm thinking? So uh, Scott uh, Pruitt, yes. So and Scott he was the Attorney General of Oklahoma. Oklahoma, yes. of, of, uh, lately uh, famous for the, um, the earthquakes, 600 yes. uh, or more per year. And uh, there are a lot of academicians anyway, uh, geophysicists, who were saying that's a you know, result of the fracking there. You know, so or the, actually, uh, this is not quite uh, specific enough. It is true that there are a lot of earthquakes uh, related to oil and gas production in Oklahoma, but this has to do almost entirely with the reinjection of produced water. Right. So uh, this can be fixed either by recycling the water or more careful geologic assessment in selecting which wells you re-inject this produced water. Well, as the secretary, or rather as the attorney general of Oklahoma, did he uh, express or develop any particular, uh, you know, position on this environmental question over the earthquakes? Because uh, well, now he goes to the EPA and, uh, you know, is he an environmentalist or the other? No, I think he is a traditional state's right federalist in the sense that his view is, you know, Oklahoma's been producing oil and gas a long time. So we don't need some, you know, disconnected bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. to tell us what to do. We have, we're responsible to our local population. 
We're responsible to our local businesses, our own tax revenues. So why does the government, why does the federal government want to come to Oklahoma and tell us how to produce oil and gas? I think that's really where he is. I think the issue of how they regulate it is a separate issue. And well, I think no. When you watch him operate, I think that's going to be a theme. You know, people are, are down on him because he's against the Clean Power Plan. Mm -hmm. But they forget 22 other states have joined him in that suit. Mm -hmm. He's not really alone on this issue. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Donald Trump has uh, said that he, he's going to uh, shrink the EPA, um, pull its wings off, um, make it smaller, uh, defund it, I don't know what. And so this is an interesting job for uh, Pruitt to get. He might be an undertaker rather than a, you know administrator here. A well, lot of people have come to Washington trying to shrink agencies that have failed. It's not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> so... So what do you think that Trump is going to, you know, given the disappointment of Scott Pruitt and his, uh, pre, you know, predilections and, um, you know, Trump's view of the EPA and, I mean, and some people, you know, reasonable people, including people who wouldn't ever have voted for Trump, uh, agree with Trump on the EPA, don't find that, it, that it's a successful agency. Some people feel it has failed in its mission. Uh, it isn't worth the money we spend to keep it going. Um, what do you think is going to happen to the EPA, all those things considered? Well, I, I, I think it's going to be a huge fight. And that the, the environmentalists are extremely well organized, extremely well funded. And what might be good about this is if we begin to have a real debate on the science and issues we talked about previously, are we spending too much at the margin? the story of the Mustang driven by Steve McQueen that we talked about last time. The whole question of, you know, what's the more cost-effective way to do these things? What's the right role for the states? What's the right role for the federal government? I think all of this stuff, we've not been able to have that debate in the Obama administration. We're, we're going to have that debate. Now. Well, okay. I, and, and, you know, this evolves. Our discussion, you know, Lou, you and me, our discussion evolves. And a few weeks ago, you know, we, the rest of the country, were in shock about what happened. Um, and, you know, we're following it. And now we have some of the, you know, the flesh is going on the bones. We see these appointments. And the other one we don't have time to talk about is uh, Ryan Zinke, uh, Department of Interior. But all these things considered, you know, we're, what, a month away from, you know, Inauguration Day. And I wondered, you sitting there with your uh, Hawaii uh, uh, shirt, <laughs> University of Hawaii shirt, but, but looking, you know, into Washington, looking, you know, across the street through the government, sitting in the lap of, you know, of what's happening. I wonder, it's a personal question, but how do you feel about things? How has, how has your thinking evolved in terms of what we, you, can expect, what energy can expect from this administration? So, I, you know, I'm pretty realistic. I've been here a long time. And, you know, the bureaucracy can blunt a lot of sharp lances. But um, I think this could be a quite exciting time if they're able to figure out the levers to expand economic growth. Once we start expanding economic growth, then we'll have some money to talk about, different things we might do that make sense. And I think almost everyone, said, you know, not every, almost everyone can agree, well, we could probably make the government more efficient. There's probably a lot of dumb things the government does. <laughs> and maybe this is a shot to fix some of those things. <laughs> I so enjoy these discussions, Lou. So uh, uh, that's Lou uh, Pugliarisi of uh, ePrint, the energy policy uh, uh, think tank in Washington, D.C., talking about energy in America, as we will again in two weeks from, from now. Uh, let's see, that will take us not quite to the end of the year, but at that time we can you know, see what else has happened what other appointments, what other revelations and uh, tweets we have received, and we'll compare notes again on the subject. Thank you, Lou. Great. I'm looking forward to it, Jay. Aloha. Aloha.